he moved to usm for his fulbright negru postdoctoral research there he worked at department of biological sciences selman university selman usa for 2 years since 2018 he is working as a scientist in the department of center for climate change studies satyabhama institute of science and technology chennai he has completed four major projects funding from the various funding agencies both national and international organization such as renian society uk wildlife conservation trust mumbai the department of science and technology dst new delhi and ruford foundation london he has published more than 35 research article one book and four book chapters he got so many awards honors grants and fellowship notably dst serb international travel grant idea wild award usa systematic research award the linnean society london uk fulbright negru postdoctoral research fellow united states india educational foundation new delhi and fulbright scholarship program usa with this rich scientific background let us invite dr prakash to deliver a lecture on wild to aquarium trade prospects and culture of ornamental invertebrates i would like to hand over the session to dr prakash in the current era this is the hot research area around the globe so dear participants make use of this opportunity hopefully the sessions will be very informative for all thank you for the opportunity please dr prakash thank you sir uh, thank you very much for your uh, detailed and wonderful introduction and it's a great pleasure uh, to present Uh, as a part of ornamental trade uh, faculty development program and i thank uh, principal management heads deans and uh, raja sir and uh, for all for uh, giving me this wonderful opportunity to present today so shall i start the screen yes sir you can press okay. is it fine uh, just minute sir yes yes sir okay hmm. and maybe i can stop the video and then talk i think maybe the bandwidth will be good is it fine yes sir okay first you present it sir your presentation yeah you, you yeah. sir you, you you please maximize your slide ah yes sir yeah. thank you So thank you once again uh, today i will be talking about uh, wild to aquarium more on the trade prospects as well as the culture of ornamental invertebrates so this includes both the freshwater as well as the marine ecosystem and uh, before i sorry so before i move on to the presentation we'll give a brief introduction about where i'm coming from So I'm from Satyabama Institute of Science and Technology, Center for Climate Change Studies, and uh, we have like four faculties and then four students working with us. And our research interest includes uh, various topics like ocean global change biology, marine and coastal biodiversity, invertebrate systematics, genomics, seaweed ecophysiology, marine field ecology and monitoring, microbial adaptations to climate change, plant insect interaction, abiotic and biotic stress on crops and uh, recently we also established the satyabama marine research station a year ago with the help of our management so we started this at the rameshwaram uh, equipped with the state of art underwater survey facilities uh, water and sediment sampling facilities plankton sampling facilities and also uh, equipped with uh, water quality monitoring uh, equipment and we also initiated established two clubs one is marine ecology research club and then citizen marine science program to bring all the researchers in one platform to discuss more on the marine biodiversity and conservation related aspects and we are also actively participating in outreach and extension to conducting various field courses and then hands on training courses in dna taxonomy and phylogeny and uh, due to the lockdown we are also again actively organizing various webinars in order to disseminate information to the researchers and then students of country 
and a brief introduction i think uh, manivanan sir has uh, explained in detail and moving on to the topic uh, first part i will be talking on the diversity of uh, freshwater ornamental invertebrates second part will be on the marine ornamental invertebrates and then slowly we move on to the trade and then we'll look into some of the statistics and then finally we go on to the aquaculture aspects where i will uh, provide you a case study on uh, marine ornamental shrimp culture especially so coming to the freshwater ornamental invertebrates whenever we say ornamental it has uh, aesthetic value right so these are like a diverse organisms which is more colorful so whenever the any animal is colorful we used to keep and maintain it as a pet right at home so these are also interesting and it's very easy to care compared to the marine uh, invertebrates so invertebrates is nothing but unlike fish they don't have a backbone so, so it lacks vertebrae or vertebral column so that's why we call it as a invertebrates and rather than rather they have a hard exoskeleton so which helps to support the body of these invertebrate animals so ornamental invertebrates are widely maintained in aquaria and it's a very popular among the hobbies that out of more than, more than fishes uh, ornamental invertebrates have are also been widely preferred in the aquaria so compared to all other invertebrates crustaceans uh, have a major share when when it comes to the trade whether it could be uh, marine ornamental invertebrates whether it could be freshwater and we have like majority of crustaceans as a in the trade uh, crustaceans mainly includes crabs shrimps and lobsters and uh, of course most of the freshwater shrimps are bred in captivity and we also have certain fishes or certain endemic fishes or rare fishes that have been still collected from the wild so coming to the crustaceans it always shed their exoskeleton in order to grow and other invertebrates include we have snails mussels and clams so these ornamental invertebrates are omnivorous which means it feeds on both plants as well as the animal feeds and it accepts wide range of foods because it has been domesticated for several years and then uh, it had, it has adapted to a wide range of uh, water quality and environmental parameters so it started accepting a wide range of foods starting from algae plants even vegetables are even we used to feed with uh, rice when when we were having gold fishes at home so it also accepts um, rice flake foods any frozen foods right and also live feeds so what it needs exactly to thrive in our home aquaria is it ha- it needs uh, clear water of course we don't uh, like to live in a polluted environment or polluted um, uh, toxic air like we don't want to breathe toxic air so similarly it also uh, uh, applicable to the fishes that are in the home aquariums that it needs a uh, clear water one thing and another is it need adequate oxygen so approximately in the water we will have almost 4 to 6 mg per liter of uh, dissolved oxygen so this is like a optimum quantity again whatever the invertebrates that thrive in the home aquaria needs a minimum of 4 to 6 mg of oxygen and it also need a stable water flow whether it could be a stagnated water water or it could be a recirculated water right so it needs a stable water flow and also a steady source of food so we can feed once in a day we can feed twice in a day or we can feed thrice in a day so most of the food items it uh, approximately matches with the 5 to 15% of their body weight right and uh, so several of the invertebrates like clams and mussels they also feed more on the detritus organisms so typically they call it these uh, scavengers as a organic waste i mean it feeds on organic waste so they call it these invertebrates as a clean up crops because it helps to recycle the nutrients so those nutrients will be accepted by the plants which we have in the aquarium and 
uh, it also helps to the detectors and the decaying matter in our home aquariums. And as I said, it, since it is these invertebrates acting as a cleanup crew, they call it, it helps to maintain the health of the aquarium. So moving to the diversity, first is ornamental slides. There are several types of ornamental sites, but I'll be highlighting with a few examples. So why ornamental? It's a firm favorite uh, among hobbies. So uh, I don't know, I haven't experienced before by keeping snails at home, um, uh, but there are, if you visit, for example, Aquarium Street at Kolathur, in most of the shops, you can uh, see these snails along with the fishes because it, it has the ability to breed in captivity and it feeds on the algae, so it helps to maintain the health of the aquarium as well as the fishes. And it, it also available in a great range of sizes, colors, and then their slow moving or crawling behavior is also add beauty to our aquariums. And there is one type of snail called assassin snail. You can see the picture below, maybe I highlight it. So here you can see the picture below, call it as assassin snails. So which uh, mainly involves in controlling the pest, pest snails that are available in the aquarium. Sometimes we used to bring water from the river, we used to bring water from the tap or well. So there will be some larval forms of fishes or snails that could come along with the water and then it will stay in the aquarium and start growing. So these assassin snails are mainly used to control the pest snails in the aquarium. So next is ornamental mussels. So again, similar to um, how the snails are actively scavenging and then uh, feeding on the dead decaying matter, these mussels are highly involved in the filtering of the water column. So mussels and uh, plants in the aquarium, it helps to maintain the quality of the water. So how it has a natural way of filtration, you can see the siphon here, right? So the water particles will be taken inside and for both clams and mussels, the water particle will be taken inside through siphon. And then those tiny particles or dust or debris or single celled algae, whatever that is available in the water column, will be trapped inside the animal tissue with the help of gills and other uh, abdominal muscles. And then after filtration, what will happen? Only the pure water will be released outside. So this acts as a very good animal if you maintain a sand-based uh, aquarium because it needs a substrate, right? It has to burrow inside the sand and then half of the uh, body shell or the siphon will be uh, protruded outside in order to feed the from the water column. So it also tolerates a wide range of temperature. So it mostly prefers the unpolluted or oxygen-rich waters. And, and it also, a bio acts as a very good bio indicator. If the water is a polluted in the wild, so these mussels and clams acts as a very good bio indicator for pollution related studies. So as I said, it partially bury themselves in the aquarium substrate. So mostly feeding and breathing is accomplished by sucking water and microorganisms through these openings. And uh, next is the crustaceans, they are mainly crabs. Uh, hermit crabs, shrimps, and lobsters are there. The first is a crab where it normally live among the submerged tree branches or aquatic plants or under or around the ranks, around the rocks. So the males will grow almost up to four to five centimeter across the carapace length, and then females are slightly smaller. So it again similar to clown, similar to gastropods. It also again um, involved in feeding on the scavengers and detritus because these are all like land crawling um, animals. So it mainly feeds on the detritus and, and scavengers. And in the in aquarium, whatever the feeds that is sinking below has been picked up by these crabs for feeding. And the sexual dimorphism is easily pronounced that we can easily identify the males and females and then allow it to breed in the in our home aquariums. And the next is ornamental lobster and these are like uh, the distribution range is limited to Western Victoria and Southern Australia and Americas. 
and uh, maybe i think in due to current there are a few um, acquire entrepreneurs who will be culturing uh, these um, lobsters or we call it as a crayfish in americas so it can be easily cultured in the captivity and they are also selling for home aquariums and maximum it can grow up to uh, 20 cm or over and they are commonly called as a yabbies so it's again omnivore so similarly it crawl like crabs and uh, hermit crabs in the <coughs> aquariums and whatever the sinking feeds that are available at the bottom it feeds on it so as i said the crustaceans used to shed exoskeleton during growth and similarly it also does and moving to the ornamental prawns so we always have a confusion to name such kind of animal whether it could be a prawn or it could be a prawn so this is like a kind of uk american english confusion so according to me whatever the prawns that are available in fresh water or call it as a prawns and then most of the marine are restricted to um, under the shrimps uh, but it's always like a confusion and they both use names shrimps and prawns for both the marine and freshwater animals and this is a matter that here i think you will be uh, very well aware of this animal because it's also edible the juvenile stages are also maintained in the aquarium at home or in the offices it's an interesting addition and uh, it can grow up to 7 cm i mean the carapace length and it's also a good scavenger that mainly feeds on the shrinking uh, food moving on to the ornamental shrimps so these are like highly colored and then it have it fetch a very good value in the freshwater aquariums so it, it you can rarely find these animals because it are all very 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 less in size and mostly attached with rock surface or sand or with the plants so you have to really identify it and then you can have to get it so these are nothing but the small freshwater shrimps mainly under the family atidae right so they call it as a atid shrimp in common and these are like interesting addition to the aquarium because these are super delicate and you can easily maintain in the aquarium without any harm but we have to be very careful that we should not keep any predatory fishes that feeds on these shrimps or any other small crustaceans because if you keep both the fishes and these kind of shrimps together then it will directly feed on these shrimps and then it will be a loss for us so these shrimps are both hardy and useful and again it also feeds on the leftover fruit as well as it grazes on the algae and it also feeds on any mucus substances that is um, that uh, deposits or settles on the plants or rocks and it has a wide range of uh, color pattern on the below we have the blue shrimps as well as on the top we have this very blood shrimp the females are brightly colored compared to males their distribution range is um in most of the asian countries we can able to get these shrimps and the maximum size is 4 cm and it can be easily sexed and bred in captivity and females has a wider abdomen to carry the eggs so the in in reproductive uh, biology point of view if you look at the difference between pinnids and caridians so it's simple caridians hold eggs and the abdomen and then they will release larvae so most of the fertilization will happen inside and then they will directly release the larvae in case of pinnid shrimp like monodon or little venami so it lays the egg in the waters and then the fertilization takes place in the um, water column so this is a major uh, biology related difference between pinnids and caridian shrimps and moving on to the water quality testing especially in home aquariums right we have a, a few parameters that we need to take care of uh, especially in the fresh water so whenever we talk about chemistry we always get scared whether whether we would understand the subject properly or not so as i said that if we are surrounded by a polluted air or toxic environment 
or even some toxic people we always move away from them right so it's similar to similar with the animals in the aquarium so whenever the our water is polluted or there is no sufficient supply of oxygen or food they always uh, behave like uh, dull or it may also end up by um, restricting the growth or it will not feed or it will settle at the bottom or finally eventually it may die so this is a um, basic ph scale so ph is nothing but referring the acidic or alkaline nature of the water so pure water we know right it's like a neutral ph so if you look at the home aquaria the ph ranges from 6.6 to 7.2 and then if you look at the ocean water it ranges from 8 to 8.2 so this is again a typical uh, wide range what they have mentioned so because this also this uh, ph um, also differs according to the region whether it could be a temperate whether it could be a sub uh, subtropical or tropical so it has a wide range but in our places like tropical countries will be maintaining from 6.8 to 7.2 mostly like a neutral ph and if you look at the marine aquaria it's almost 8 and then 8 plus and the another uh, important parameter is the nitrogen so it's the fourth uh, most abundant element in the fish body right so even in our dna we have nitrogen and then most of the proteins and amino acids are made up of a nitrogenous compound right so obtains how animals get nitrogen because by feeding on plants or animals through fish food right whatever uh, we are giving to the fishes and it's one of the nitrogen based waste product is ammonia so here you can see whatever the feed we give it will be like kind of inorganic nitrogen or organic nitrogen and it what it releases is uh, ammonia it's nh3 plus and these ammonia are highly toxic to the fishes because it cannot breathe properly and this ammonia has a direct uh, impact when it combines with the ph if there is a slight change in the ph then this uh, the reaction of ammonia will be more severe in the fishes so these ammonia mainly affect the gills so it can't breathe well and then eventually it, it affects the survival so it can be easily solved through a biological filtration process so whatever the fish feed will come it eventually settle as a ammonia so there are two bacteria which is a nitrosomonas and then nitrobacter which converts the ammonia into a nitrite even nitrite is very toxic and then it converts the nitros nitrobacter will convert nitrite into nitrite so this is like a simple uh, biological filtration process in the home aquaria be directly taken by the plants during photosynthesis so next is oxygen as i said there will be like almost 4 to 6 mg of uh, mg per liter of all dissolved oxygen is required it's again an important chemical because animal has to breathe it's not only for animals but also for the bacteria because if it wants to decompose the organic waste the bacteria needs a lot of oxygen to convert the organic waste into a inorganic waste so most of the freshwater fishes it has unique adaptations to cope up with the low oxygen concentrations and the salinity it don't have uh, much importance when it uh, comes to the freshwater fishes and then hardness it will be like abundant in sea water but we don't need to worry much in the freshwater but some uh, fresh water sources like rivers or if it is combined with industrial effluents then it will be rich in calcium magnesium or silica compound and if you look at the range of um, tolerance for dissolved oxygen in fish it's as i said it's a parts per million or we call it as a milligram per liter so if it exceeds more than 6 right you can see the diversity or abundance or population would be more in a 
oxygen rich waters so moving on to the marine ornamental invertebrates so nearly there are 725 species that are available in the trade according to rain at all 2017 and uh, similar to freshwater ornamental i mean marine ornamental invertebrates are rich in color and then more delicate in nature so what are the diversities we can find is we have corals so of course in india it's uh, protected under uh, wildlife protection act schedule one but other uh, countries are allowing or importing corals and then allow, allowing the hobbies to keep at the home aquariums so we have sabellid worms or we call it as a tube worms we have sea anemones right and then we have hermit crabs like similar to land hermit crab we also have a marine hermit crab as a ornamental pet we also have a porcelain crab which is associated with sea anemones we also have giant clams of course giant clam is also protected under the wildlife protection act we have brachyuran crabs or coral crabs we have sea urchins and starfishes <coughs> so out of all these invertebrates there is one group which always outperform in the ornamental trade so that is marine ornamental shrimps so in order to uh, uh, get the status of being ornamental you need to have a certain qualities right so so the few qualities are
given. And uh, majority of the import has been uh, uh, done by USA, so almost 16.5% in the, with the worth of 42.9 million dollars. So if you look at uh, the region-wise share, Asia, as I said, it's contributing US million dollar 197, and then followed by European and then other countries. If you look at the top 10 exporting countries, so Singapore tops first, as I said, it, it holds a major share. And if you look at uh, the importing countries, it's almost, as I said, United States is a first importing country followed by UK and Germany. So if we look at the top 10 European countries, as I said, in the freshwater imports, so UK is like almost 25% of the share followed by Germany. And if you look at the non-European countries, even Singapore is top with the exports as well as the imports because Singapore holds almost 24% of the major share. So why it is because most of the small island nation, uh, they don't have a proper logistics or uh, uh, export market from their country. So what they initially does is they collect all the ornamental fishes, they quarantine it, they pack it, and then they will send it to Singapore. So from Singapore, they will again uh, organize everything and then they will send it to different countries. So similarly, if you look at the India's position in uh, global ornamental fish trade, it was almost 0 0.3. And uh, so uh, even uh, if you look at a small nation compared to us, it's Sri Lanka, right? So it has a major share of 2.9%. But again, it's similar to what is happening with the Singapore because Maldives don't have any direct link for the exports. So whatever the fishes that has fishes or shrimps that has been collected from Maldives, especially for the marine aquarium trade, and it has been uh, sent it to the Sri Lanka. So from Sri Lanka, it will get dispersed to the other uh, European and as well as America. <coughs> So moving on to the last part of my talk is aquaculture. It's a culture of uh, ornamental invertebrates. So here I'll be mentioning um, one case study, especially for the marine ornamental shrimps, because most of uh, uh, most of us don't know much. Because keeping or maintaining ornamental invertebrates and then breeding in freshwater aquarium is very easy, and you don't need to really struggle to find whether it's a male or female, what we did, how, we will, how it will lay the eggs, and then how the larval will rear. So it's very simple when it is uh, coming to the freshwater, but if it comes to the marine, then it will be like a very difficult part. Each and every step has to be taken care of. Right? So why the concept of aquaculture came? Because as I said, most of the marine ornamental shrimps are widely collected from the wild. So aquaculture is considered as a suitable alternative to minimize the pressure on the wild stock. So if captive bred animals are available with me, so anyone can come and directly purchase from me, right? So they don't need to depend on the fishermen to go to the sea and then collect the ornamental fishes. And then the biggest advantage is the survival of shrimps under the captive bred condition is very hard. And uh, aquaculture is again important to gain knowledge on the life history stage. So we can study the sexual biology, we can study the larval behavior and feeding, and we can also study the reproductive or mating performance of the shrimps. And uh, what it would does is it reduces the impact on an endemic or target species. If some of the species are highly targeted or highly exploited, with the help of any ornamental trade or commercial uh, methods or commercial consumption. So this aquaculture acts as a proper uh, alternative in order to replenish the stocks in the wild. So we can produce those uh, fishes in the captivity and then we can re ranch it even in the sea to increase the natural stock. So it also helps us to understand or innovate uh, to bring hybrids or new colors. So if you look at uh, the freshwater fishes, there'll be like only one uh, gold fish 
species. But if you look at the color variants or hybrids, you will have like almost more than 150 different types of goldfishes that are available in the market. But all these come under only one species. So similarly, we can also bring innovations. We can also bring hybrids or different color morphotypes in the aquacultured uh, marine ornamentals. And it also generates income for coastal and island communities. Even in the COVID, uh, midst of COVID, we can't uh, really go out and then do the fishing, right? So even in this pandemic crisis, this aquaculture is a very good opportunity to generate income for the coastal and island communities. So they can easily keep it in their back in their backyards and in their home to produce more fishes or shrimps. And what could be the major constraints? Uh, this is especially related to the marine ornamental shrimps because it display reproductive traits. So if you look at the first picture, this is the fire shroom called Lismata debilis. So this is like a protandrous simultaneous hermoprodite. So hermoprodite means you have both the male and female sex together in one animal, right? So what is the problem here? Because you cannot really identify whether it's a male or female. And, but the advantage here with the protandrous simultaneous hermoproductism is you can keep any two shrimps and then it will one acts as a male and then another acts as a female and then vice versa. So the both will mate each other and then the both will produce almost 3,000 to 6,000 uh, eggs in their abdomen. So it's a very advantageous and also a major constraint. And uh, there is a complex pattern of sex reversal. As I said, once it grows, it grow. I mean, it uh, uh, develop as a male, and then it will change its sex to the female or vice versa. And the maintenance of broodstock under captivity is again a difficult part because the technologies have not been standardized for uh, these ornamental shrimps, right? And then there is also a lack of suitable life feeds, whether it could be a larvae, whether it could be uh, adult shrimps, right? And then there is a long duration for larval development. So these shrimps are like almost 60 to 100 days of larval development. So this is also like kind of a challenging, right? You have to standardize the larvae, you have to standardize the feed, and then you have to produce more larvae. And it will switch like, high values in the market. So it's also vulnerable to changing environmental conditions. As I said, how the oxygen and then pH and then nitrogen is affecting the freshwater environment, it's again similar. So this is like a, a small overview about the sexual biology, especially in the marine ornamental shrimps. So we have gonocori, right, which has a separate males and separate females. We have uh, uh, a simple protandry, which is having a juvenile male phase and female phase. We have a protandry with primary males or primary females, right? And also we have protandrous simultaneous hermaphroditism, where we have both male and female phase of the same animal. So what will be the major requirements if we want to go for a culture of these ornamental shrimps? It's a selection of root stocks. As I said, uh, whether it could be uh, hermoproductic shrimps or it could be a gonocoric shrimps, right? And we have to understand the reproductive system, like how it mate and then how it uh, reproduces. And we can also need to go for a formulated piece because uh, since now the fishing and other activities are so much restricted, we can't uh, directly depend on the frozen feeds or live feeds. So we have to standardize certain methods to produce a kind of pellet feeds how we are using for a commercial is more so We have to formulate these kind of uh, pellet feeds so that we can easily feed with the feed for the brooders. And there is also, we need to understand the biology ecology as well as the behavioral characters, which is again linked to the point number one. And we also work on the live feed prey and the enrichment protocol, like what type of feed it will take. I think uh, we will discuss that in a minute. And then there is a seawater uh, recirculated aquaculture system is a standardized and then suitable method for uh, rearing this ornamental marine ornamental shrimps. And uh, tank design and dimensions can be taken care of. 
and then other technical equipments like water pumps, pipes, right? Other water quality parameters testing, and then quarantine systems, etc. So if you look at the brood stock management, uh, so in the biological characteristics, first, first is could be it could be whether it's a symbiotic, right? I said few of the ornamental shrimps are living with sea urchins or sea anemones, or it also perform a cleaning behavior, right? So we need to really see which type of organism will suit best for the aquaculture production. And then looking at the gonochoric or hermaphroditic shrimps, right? And then breeding or spawning season, we have to take in care of. But most of the marine ornamental shrimps um, uh, that is available in the trade are like uh, throughout the year brooders. So the average incubation period takes almost eight to 12 days or 16 days, depends upon the species. And then they are like throughout the year breeders. And then we have to look at the sex ratio, like, like how we have in uh, fishes, whether it could be one is to one or it could be one is to two or one is to three male female ratios. And we have to look at the reproductive cycle, like how long the eggs will get incubated and then how frequently the females will molt and then produce eggs. And the environmental parameters, and then simulation of optimum brood stock condition, whether we need a proper oxygen, optimum level of light settings, optimum level of temperature, salinity, pH, and all those uh, necessary uh, parameters. And if you look at the infrastructure, it could be whether flow through or recirculation system, and the water quality parameters need to be taken care of. And we can have a quarantine facility because initial brooders need to be purchased from the traders, right? So they have to collect from um, the wild. So whether it should not come with any parasites or any um, diseases, right? So we need to quarantine before introducing into our brood shop facility. So next is the artificial seawater, or if we are near the coast, we can easily uh, bring the natural seawater. It should be very good, but if we are in uh, uh, cities like Hyderabad or Delhi, we can easily make use of the artificial seawater. So there are uh, marine salt or sea salt that will be available in packs. So we just need to take and then mix it with the uh, regular tap waters or RO waters. So we can easily introduce the shrimps and fishes and then allow them to breathe. And a selection of tank materials, it could be a glass tank or acrylic plastic or fiber resistive glass tanks, uh, fiber resistive plastic tanks, and then other parameters. So uh, two examples which I would uh, like to bring here as a part of my PhD studies. So one uh, species on the left, which will be displaying separate sexes, as I said, gonochoric. So here you have the female, right? If you look at uh, the appendages or the legs, you can't find uh, much difference. But if you look at the females, it has a extended appendages. So you can easily identify from this whether it could be a male shrimp or it could be a female shrimp. So we can sell it. Uh, uh, we can put it in a tank for mating purposes. So here there are uh, three types of mating behavior which we observe. One is like uh, touching with the appendages. So in order to recognize the females, the males used to touch with the appendages, right? Receptive females. Whenever once the molting occurs in the female, the male has to uh, catch the female and then mate immediately, right? Before uh, the shell gets hardened. So the first behavior would be touching with the help of appendages and then uh, antennas and legs. And then second will be crawling behavior, right? That it used to ride on the females from one side or the other side. And the third behavior is like holding, hold fast or holding behavior. So this will help to uh, help the male and females to copulate each other. So similar to uh, other mammals and animals, so the shrimps also do like up and down um, um, chain like uh, motions and then it will copy, send, uh, it will deposit the spermatophores into the female abdomen. Right. And uh, the next one is displace exchanging behavior, which is uh, the hermo simultaneous hermoproductions. Right? So here you have both males and females. As I said, it will be similar in size and it holds both male and female sexual characters. Right? 
So here you can see both the shrimps have the eggs under the abdomen. So one has uh, spawned the egg, right, released the larvae, and then got molted. So you can see the difference in the color. Maybe uh, it has been taken with the normal camera if, um, in, I mean, almost uh, 10 to 8 to 10 years before. So the photo may not be much clear. Uh, but you can see that here one shrimp has released the larvae and got molted. And then the other shrimp has started chasing him, right? You can see the sea picture. It started ch chasing him for the mating. And you can also see now both the shrimps as the second shrimp also released the larvae, right? So the molting, I mean the mating and the spawning will happen simultaneously in both the shrimps. So here there is a hermoproductic shrimp which has been uh, maintained alone as a part of one of our experiments. So what we have did is in order to see whether it has the ability to self-fertilize uh, because it has both male and female sexual character in the same animal, right? Same individual. So we just want to check whether the uh, self-fertilization is happening um, uh, with this animal. But unfortunately, uh, it spawned the eggs, but the eggs does not show any development, right? You can see only the color is green. Uh, once the egg started growing, it, uh, it, the color changes from green to uh, dark brown. So we can't uh, uh, see this, that development in the self-fertilization. I mean, the self-fertilization is not happening. And then the eggs will be consumed by the female itself, right, within two days. So this is a simple uh, recirculation system, right, in the home aquaria where we can use the sump as well as protein skimmers and then some filtrations. But if you go for a breeding purposes, here there will be like a sequence of tanks that would be arranged. And here you have a net where whenever the larvae gets released, it can be uh, separately collected and then move on to a different tanks for larval rearing. And if you look at the embryonic development, as I said, initially it will be uh, like a blastoderm, green in color. Once it develops, it will, it will change to brown in color. And then you can clearly look at the visible eye spots and development. So there are four uh, major steps, especially in this marine ornamental shrimps. So one is the bright green color with no visible blastoderm. And then there will be a cleavage takes place and the yolk will be utilized and you can observe the presence of eye spots, right? And then in the last stage, the embryos will be completely developed and your eyes are prominent and abdomen will be free from the cephalothorax. And then it will be ready to release the larvae. So once the larvae comes out, as I said, the duration takes like almost 60 to 100 days. So if you look at the different uh, zoyal stages and the megalopa have been observed in these ornamental shrimps. Because each and every stage of larvae will take almost two to four days. So if you calculate for uh, 11 stages, 11 to 12 stages, then it will be approximately 48 to 50 days. And this larval duration, it also depends upon the water condition as well as the different live feed which we are giving to the ornamental shrimps. And this is again a larviculture shrimp, or uh, they call it as a plankton creasel, where uh, proper life feeds have been provided, right? It has been continuously supplied, and then the larvae as well as the life feed will be continuously dispersed and then spread throughout the tank. As I said, it has a long larval duration from 43 to 110 days, depends upon the uh, species. And the lack of suitable uh, feed for different stages is also a major constraint in the larviculture system. So this is again a typical example uh, for maintaining the ornamental shrimps larvae recirculated system. So if you look at the market value, the cost of brooders will be almost 3,000 rupees um, per pair. It again depends upon the species. And if you look at the cost of metamorphosed larvae and single individual cost almost 200 to 300 uh, rupees per piece. And uh, the number of larvae produced will be 2,000 to 3,000. This is again per individual. And then as, as I said, it's a, a frequent breeders, right? Throughout the year brooder and it used to breed, breed 
uh, produce eggs within 10 to 20 days depends upon the species. So monthly you can get on an average almost two to uh, three uh, egg cycle and then it will be almost 20 to 30,000, I mean uh, six to uh, 10, 10,000 eggs would be produced every month in one individual. So if you look at the survival rate, it depends upon the feed and optimum conditions, it will be almost 60 to 70 percent. So live prey production, which is a plankton, a primary source of food, right? And uh, it's a cost as well as the labor intensive because maintaining uh, live feed is a big task. And it also, maintaining this is also required uh, 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 knowledge on the nutritional properties and the zoological properties as well as the microbiological information of these animals because we need to uh, have live feed cultures like algae to feed for these rotifers, artemias and copepods. And out of rotifers and artemia, copepods are like highly nutritive, uh, nutritive and then highly suitable for the ornamental culture. And uh, we also have artemia where the newly hatched artemia are uh, mostly given to these uh, marine ornamental species. And coming to the microalgae, which is mainly diatoms and uh, dinoflagellates will be maintained uh, uh, with a suitable medium called the Gillard F by 2 medium. So this will be used to feed those uh, uh, rotifers, artemias and copepods for enrichment as well as feeding. And uh, this is a small setup uh, of a microalgae. And uh, these are the production rate of uh, rotifers, artemias, and copepods. And uh, I think I will be sharing the slide with them so you can uh, go through it. And uh, yeah. And whenever we go for uh, cultured specimen or aquaculture, we always need to do the SWOT analysis. It's nothing but we have to analyze our strengths, we have to analyze our weakness, opportunities, and the threats. So, what could be the strength? Uh, if we want to start aquaculture research or aquaculture hatcheries, so we need to uh, look for a collaboration with the scientific communities because they will be very efficient in standardizing the technology or they will be having different innovation technologies for maintaining the ornamental shrimps under captivity. So we can adopt those technologies and then we can produce any cost effective methods. right? And whenever we are producing in the captive condition, we can mention it as an eco-friendly or captive produce so that it would fetch high market values. And what could be the weaknesses? Uh, we don't have much skilled workers, right? And the labor is expensive, especially in this pandemic crisis. It will be very difficult because most of them working here are like a migratory labor. So they would have gone back to the native, right? And then cost of electricity. So whenever you go for a big company or institutes, it will be considered as a commercial. So the cost of electricity would be high and then maintenance of live feeds. And we also have a lack of knowledge on the reproductive biology of the animal which we are maintaining in the captivity. So if you look at the opportunities, we always diversify the production by recruiting new shrimp species into the uh, culture or the trade, and we can also increase uh, the color or size, you know, through um, genetic modification or value addition by in increasing uh, the color and all. And captive fishes are harder, as I said, and it's also less prone to diseases. And it will also indirectly support the coral reef conservation because we are minimizing the threat on the south as well as their associated habitat. So if you look at the threats, uh, uh, price competition will be less because while the specimens are mostly adult and then they fetch more values compared to the um, uh, captive bred uh, shrimps because what we are going to sell are only small shrimps. So competition from other breeders, they have to see who are all uh, really involved in breeding, right? And then uh, unfriendly fishing practices is again a major threat, right? So because most of the fishermen may not know to collect the fish friendly or in a sustainable way. So they might be using um, uh, destructive fishing practices, right? That would affect not only the fishes, but also the uh, 
habitats and uh, uh, unorganized most of the indian ornamental trade is unorganized and then we also have a blind enforcement of laws and policies because most are restricted to paper and not, not much on the implementation stream so i think uh, these are few sources which i have used and with this uh, i would like to stop here and uh, i am many thanks uh, to the organizer raja sir and then kongu college of arts and sciences for the wonderful opportunity to present my talk and then it's uh, a great pleasure and honor uh, to be to present in front of you all and uh, thank you for joining us uh, joining me today for in the middle of this covid lockdown period thank you uh, uh so uh, thank you dr prakash sir yes uh, now the session is uh, open for questions yeah yeah this uh, is uh, dr sanam from uh, bharatidasan university yes sir uh, yeah i am very proud to be a student of dr prakash i mean uh, i am teacher of uh, mr Pra dr prakash yes sir uh, my compliments and uh, appreciation dr prakash for your uh, excellent enthusiastic and inter inspirational speech Okay, Thank I you. think this is uh, uh, one of the uh, excellent uh, talk I attended. Okay, uh, my Thank compliments. Uh, 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 this presentation shows your uh, expertise and knowledge in the particular area uh, that is ornamental, especially the yes. innovative trade streams. Okay, so my yeah. compliments, and I uh, extend sincere thanks to organizer for bringing a, a excellent resource person like uh, Dr. Pragash. So. this i my once again i convey my compliments and uh, appreciation to my student thank you yes uh, thank you dr sandaram sir uh, uh, sir uh, dr prakash sir uh, yes, uh, some some of the questions are posted in the chat box uh, sure sir uh, can you able to view or uh, shall i read out one by one uh, you can read out sir i don't know where i am at the chat yeah. box so yeah please sir. thank yeah, you sir please yeah, yeah, yeah i will read out sir one by one okay Uh, sir actually uh, uh, which type of uh, disease most affected ornamental vertebrate ornamental vertebrate they have posted vertebrate uh, wrongly actually because the oh, session is uh, mm. yeah you know mostly uh, we have like uh, vibrio infections will be there so which is widely so if you look at uh, clown fish when i was working with uh, namla university for phd we observed some fungal infections also in clown fishes and especially in ornamental marine ornamental streams we have uh, came across uh, vibrio infection so mostly if it is coming captured from the wild there it will be fine but once uh, the ornamental suppliers whoever is giving streams to us they will be maintaining and in their home aquarium for few days so maybe the water may not be good or whether due to transport or stress so it's prone to vibrio infections so we have observed we have also isolated vibrio parahemolyticus from both shrimps as well as in the clown fishes okay sir thank you sir so the next question is whether any sea ranching is entertaining to enhance the wild stock ah uh, yes sir i think uh, if i'm right cmfra and uh, rgc and other institutes are uh, Uh, involved in sea ranching even there are a few projects for uh, silla sarata and other uh, uh, pinnates so pinnate shrimps so they are doing sea ranching to increase the stock especially thank you sir yeah the next question is what is the lifespan of the ornamental shrimps starting from eggs to complete adult um it ranges from 4 to 6 years yeah even we have maintained for more than 2 to 1 half years in the captivity so we brought as a wild which is almost 1 to 2 year old and then we have maintained in a captivity for another 1 to 2 years so approximately it would range from 4 to 6 years you can okay sir thank you sir next question uh, is nowadays uh, the eye stock ablation is used for shrimp breeding ah uh, yes sir they are still doing for eye stock but when it comes to marine ornamental shrimp the size is too small so what we get is almost 6 to 8 cm of maximum sizes so as i said it's a throughout year breeder it's not like uh, pinnates or you know macrobrachium so you need to really induce you don't want to really induce the maturation or breeding purposes 
So these are like throughout the year builders, and every time you have like uh, frequently in 10 to 20 days, you will be continuously getting eggs from those shrimps. So oh, thank you. you don't have to really work on eye stack ablations and all. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, thank you, doctor. Just, uh, so thank you, doctor. Next question. Um, so nowadays there are several parasite infection occur and easily infection causes to shrimps. Yeah. What all the preventive measures and how to avoid? Uh, first one is to maintain a good water quality. If you are uh, maintaining in, so we can do proper filtration. And the second one is uh, using a better quarantine facility. Like once we bring the fish or shrimps from the uh, wild, we should not directly introduce to the brooder tank or the airing tank. So what we can do is we can keep a separate quarantine tanks and then keep and then observe. You can, there will be like methyl green, I mean, malachite green, methylene blue, potassium permanganate, even formalin dips are uh, they used to give. And uh, so those kind of basic quarantine, even normal salt water to fresh water, so vice versa can be used for uh, quarantine facilities. So that will uh, mainly reduce the infections, whether it could be bacteria or fungi or protozoans or any other parasites. So the infection might get reduced eventually. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. So the next question is, what would be an alternative for those who have long larval development? Uh, we cannot uh, have any alternatives because lar larval is it's, it's the natural way of uh, you know, growth in shrimps, right? So we, cannot make, we can do like a kind of a genetic modification. So any gene replacement can be done. If you want to innovate something or if you want to make anything hybrid, we can make like, of course, most of the research have been done in the freshwater, but not much on the marine component. So what we can do is we can easily go for uh, any innovative methods like gene modifications, like gene replacement or editing in order to increase the growth, right? And then in order to uh, uh, fast, in order to make the quick larval development. So we can also do with the help of feeds, right? If we give an enriched feed, even the 60 days larval growth will take in 40 days or 45 days. So it also, it not only depends on the fish side, but also depends on how we are maintaining it. Um, thank you, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, um, sir, actually, uh, I, I'll start with this question because I mean, oh, many okay. questions are keep on posting in the chat box. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, after this, after answering this question, I request you, sir, you please uh, post your um, uh, mail ID in the chat box uh, so sure, that sir. the participants will mail you personally and then they get their clarification. Yeah, yeah, sir. Okay, so this is the last question. Um, uh, sir, uh, why there is a lack of live feed? It is highly demanded. Uh, how to overcome this problem? Um, yeah, sir. As I said, that for even larval uh, fishes in the freshwater, we used to give small pellet feeds or powder feeds, right? So that kind of uh, technology we can also bring for the uh, marine ornamental uh, larvae. So currently, we are working on one of the project where uh, we standardize the technology for uh, broodstock pellet types as a part of my PhD, so my shrimps will um, uh, normally feed on these pelleted diets, which is uh, lipid enriched and coated to increase the brood stock maturation in ornamental shrimps. So similarly, uh, as an extension of that study, I'm also planning to make a, a pellet feeds for this larval stage. So larval stages will be uh, continuously moving in the water column, right? So it's again a difficult task. I don't know how it can be done. But currently, we are working on it, and then we will be soon uh, making, because again, maintaining life feeds is a difficult task, right? And uh, it needs a lot of labor work. So if we produce any feed that can be like a floating feeds, right, or floating powder kind of, so that can be easily consumed by the larvae. So like uh, fish larvae, shrimp larvae will not engulf the food as it is. So it will directly hold the feed, and then it will crunch on it. So I think these uh, floating feeds would be of much helpful uh, to rear the ornamental shrimps. So I hope so. Let's see. Thank you, Doctor. Um, uh, sir, uh, you please post your uh, mail ID in the chat box. Uh, right yes, now. Sir, I have posted my email ID. 
now i, I request the participants uh, okay uh, you please uh, make use of the uh, mail id of dr prakash to send your questions and get clarification um, uh, yes. before, before go for the what are thanks I, I i would i would like to present uh, uh, i would like to ask ram ram shailash uh, sir dr prakash sir uh, is a really yeah. what it's a really wonderful presentation uh, so the participants are highly um, uh, admired by your excellent presentation uh, and then uh, uh, as we are conducting this session uh, by online uh, uh -huh. so we are not able to honor you in person but anyway as a token of love oh, and yeah. appreciation we are presenting yeah. Yeah, appreciation certificate uh, over the screen. Kindly oh. accept. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity. Yeah, it's yes. a great pleasure to be as a part of uh, this uh, wonderful uh, event. Sir, your your certificate is uh, on the screen. Ah, yes, sir. Sure, sir. Ah, I think uh, it would be fine, sir. Maybe instead of. Uh, Satyabhama University can make it as a Satyabhama Institute of Science and Technology. No, no problem at all, sir. We'll change it. Yes, yes sir. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Yeah, um, sir fine. Okay. Uh, now, yes. I request Dr. S. Vengada Chalam, R. Vengada Chalam, Assistant Professor, Department of Zoology, to propose the vote of thanks. Dr. Vengada Chalam, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Please. Yes. Good evening to one and all gathered here for third day ornamental fish production trade and technology and transfer on the topic wild to aquarium trade prospects and the culture of ornamental in the trade. Myself, Dr. R. Venkatachalam, working as a student professor in zoology, Kumar Arsenal College, Coimbatore. I am proud to propose what I thank you. I would like to thank our Honorable President, Dr. Ramanathan, our Assistant College, and my sincere thanks to our Honorable Secretary, Madam, Secretary and Director, Dr. Sini Vasudhanan, always helping us in various ways for conducting day activities. My gratitude goes to Dr. M. Lakshma Sansa, Principal, and Chairman for the Seven day entrepreneurship skill development program, Kumanar Arsenal College, Pointer. And I would like to thank our Dean RD, Paul Sanchar, and Dean Academic, Madam Sanchar. I thank to Dr. S. Dinukumari, Assistant Professor, Esori Inja, Department of Geology, Kumanar Arsenal College, Pointer. I also extend my thanks to Dr. S. Raja, Post Director. And Dr. S. Manivanan and Dr. K. Ramanan, coordinator, coordinator of this session and assistant professor of the Department of Zoology, Kumarasan College, Coimbatore. Also, I thank assistant professor in the Zoology Department and organizing secondary, uh, organizing team of the session. On behalf, on, on the behalf of the management and Department of Zoology, I thank today. Chief Guest Dr. S. Prakash, scientist, Satyabhama University, Chennai. Sir, you gave a very excellent talk on today's talk. It may be very useful for our students as well as participants from various academic institutions and uh, research institutions uh, to become an entrepreneur in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, now the now the session is over. I request the participants uh, please join with us uh, tomorrow as early as possible uh, uh, before two thirty uh, p.m. And then the tomorrow session also will be uh, streamed uh, live in the YouTube live. Those who are not able to join the join the session through Google Meet, uh, Google, Google Meet, you please join with us through the YouTube live session. Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Prakash. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Th thank you, Mr. Uh, Ramshailesh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manivanan, sir. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.